Welcome to the Art and Science of Complex Sales. This is a podcast where we explore how the best B2B sales leaders make the complex simple, drive relationships and revenue, and generally elevate the sales profession. In this podcast, we're bringing together sales experts, thought leaders, top account executives, buyers, industry insiders, all to share their experiences and best practices for navigating the complex sales cycle. So whether you're a seasoned sales professional, a sales leader, or just starting out, you're going to find practical insights and actionable advice that you can apply to your own sales journey. Plus, we have a bit of fun. Our guest today on the art and science of complex sales is Scott Lees. Scott focuses on personally increasing transparency and leadership in the world of sales to get results. He's author of three books, More Than a Number, From Rep to Manager, and Addicted to the Process. He's a top LinkedIn sales personality and CEO and founder of Scott Lees Consulting. In these roles, he's impacted the lives of countless salespeople and sales leaders for the better. So let's get rolling. All right, everybody. Welcome back to the show, The Art and Science of Complex Sales. I am here with a, uh, well, a new friend. I just met him actually about uh, five minutes ago, but I'm really excited for the conversation. I'm here with Scott Lees. What's up, Paul? Thanks for having me, man. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. We, uh, we start the show with one general question that I hope everybody answers, and that is, we're all in this crazy game of sales together, but nobody takes the time to sit down and define it. What is your definition of sales? I literally don't remember the last time somebody asked me this question. So I do not have like a predefined answer. So I'm going to spin one up. There you go. Rock and roll. (laughs) Uh, Kind of funny how, you know, you've been in the business for however long you've been in the business. And then somebody says, what's sales? And I'm like, oh, shit. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I don't know what it is, actually. Well, you know. I think somebody has this thing and they want somebody else to buy it and benefit from it. It theoretically solves some problem that they have. So how do we get it in front of this audience? And then how do we help them understand that our product or our solution is the right one at the right time to help them with whatever they're they're going through and that that art and science combination is what i would call sales where does it start does it start uh i mean do you do you say sales there's some people that take sales and say well it starts at the the second somebody sees a message about you or even before that uh where does this i you know where does sales start i think it starts with the inception of your service or your product i mean, let's say you and i decide right now to start a surfboard company. That's okay. sweet. All right. Yeah, when, are we, awesome. when, when are we going to do this? behind yes. you with the ocean and I'm like, yes. why am I not at the ocean surfing at that spot behind? All right. When, when are we going to do this? And let's, let's start. So let's just start the yeah. exercise here. Right. Okay. So we're going to start a surfboard company. So we just started selling right now mm-hmm. in my mind, because maybe we have to raise capital. Well, that's going to be a sale. Maybe we have to, uh, you know, hire a shaper because unless you know how to shape surfboards somebody's got to do that for us so we've got to bring somebody into the the project well that's recruiting that's sales we have to figure out well, what do we where are we going to distribute these boards we're going to have to make some calls and get distribution that's sales what are we going to price this thing at that's a sales conversation I, so i think it be, begins at inception when you're creating a good or providing a service that's where it begins i don't think it begins with a message getting out in front of somebody else if Mm -hmm. i don't have any designs on how i can sell this thing i don't have a product a service or a company yeah i think there's a that's that's evidenced i think if well you know it if you're in the vc firm or pre-vc angel angel firm there is uh i've met a lot of a lot of people that have an idea Right. The, yeah. So I, I love this definition because I have a lot of people that have an idea, but they have no clue how that idea will make an impact uh, for somebody else or even help improve their world or solve a problem. It's just it's just an idea and it's an idea without a home. Right. Yeah. And if you have an idea without a home, it it means nothing. I like that. If you have an idea without a home, 
you're homeless. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. There, there's, if you have the an world idea of without homeless a home, ideas. you'll end up homeless. <laughs> <laughs> there's our quote. There's the title of the episode, Paul. There you go, Rocket. It usually takes us to the end to figure that out, but that's great. I think we nailed it. Um, no, so how did you get started? So take me back to the beginning of, of you getting into sales. How did you get started with this? Yeah, well, this, this will now take the episode in a different direction from the humor. Okay that we began it, but, um, I was never this kid that sold stuff, you know, as a kid, I wasn't, I didn't have a lemonade stand or I wasn't entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial in any way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. You know, I was solely focused on playing sports really when I was young, I played a bunch of sports in high school. I got a a full ride, uh, in college. I I played tennis and soccer for division two school in the Bay area. All I cared about really was just like, you know, my practices, my games, all that kind of thing. I figured I'd eventually, you know, get a job, maybe teaching or something like that, like my, my dad. Um, And then uh, I graduated with a degree in psychology and a minor in religious studies. Mm -hmm. I decided to go to grad school because get this, I didn't want to fucking work. And I also think, <laughs> and I also <laughs> needed something that wasn't like a, a gap year kind of thing. I wanted to like somehow be productive still. So I'm like, I'm going to go mm-hmm. get a master's degree. Yeah. So at the end of my first year of grad school, um, I had attempted to finish a two year program in one year while teaching a full undergraduate course load at mm-hmm. Arizona state while also playing soccer. It was the most stressful year of my life and my body basically uh, exploded. Wow. I got super, super sick right before my 23rd birthday. I'm 6'2", 195. I, I went down to about 140 pounds. Holy I, mackerel. You know, was near death and uh, it took them a while to figure out what was going on. Turned out that I developed a bunch of autoimmune diseases, had ulcerative colitis, they told me that my insides looked like I'd had this disease for, you know, 20 something years. Uh, it just got real, real bad, real dangerous, real fast. I spent the next four years primarily in the hospital fighting for my life. I had nine surgeries, four major emergency abdominal surgeries, had a total colectomy, had uh, colon cancer developing. I could go on and on and on about the yeah. night nightmare of an experience. So that started right when I was 23. And this is, you know, 20 something years ago, Paul. It's not like I'm in the hospital watching fucking Netflix and texting my friends. This is isolation nation. Okay. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. I didn't even have, they had like two channels on the TV. So when I was up for it, all I could really do was read. I read God knows how many books. Now, I wasn't reading like business books and all this kind of stuff. I was reading all sorts of like tales of struggle and triumph and science fiction novels and all this kind of thing. But what happened was I I started crafting this narrative inside of myself, which is like, I am strong as hell. This would have killed most people. And this is not going to kill me. Like, I'm like a fucking cockroach. I could survive a nuclear winter. Like, I'm going to get through this. And I'd already been super competitive as an athlete. I already knew what it was like to work my butt off, right? I knew what it was like to lose sometimes more than you win, pick yourself back up. And as I got further into this journey, you know, some of my teammates would come visit me. And one of my teammates told me that he had been in sales the last few years, which I didn't even know because, you know, I had no access to the outside world, really. He was like, you know, when you get better, you should consider coming to work with me or at least get in sales because you're the most competitive guy that I've ever met. You're stubborn as a son of a bitch. You're very convincing. And, you know, I was the captain of both my college teams for four years. You've got leadership ability. So he was like trying to egg me on like, hey, you could have a future here. And I'm like, dude, I've been, I'm like not confident outside of the sporting field. I'm a wallflower super introverted kind of person. I don't know about this. I get healthy. 
once I get healthy from my sickness, I have this little problem called opioid addiction because I've been on pain meds for four years. Yeah. So then I had to cold turkey off of dope. That was a whole thing. So I get through all this stuff and I'm, you know, I got to rebuild everything, man. My body, my energy level, all this stuff. I'm like, I'm going to go, I'm going to try this sales job. Super non-stressful career choice mm -hmm. for somebody who just got out of a living hell, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I go, I, I interview and the, the guy's like, why should I hire you, man? You've literally never had a job, you know, since school. I don't, I don't get it. And I just told him my story. Like I told you right now. And I said, listen, most people on your sales floor are probably just like happy to be there. They're glad they have a job. I have fought like hell for four years to even have this conversation with you. If I can figure out how to sell, I'm going to be the best like undrafted free agent you've ever found. That's what I told him, you know, and I guess he bought the story. So that's how I kind of got into sales. And, you know, I, I created this like character for myself basically where I didn't have to change who I was as a person. I just had to change who I was while I was at work and I didn't have to be scared or shy anymore. I'd already kind of defeated the hardest thing that I would as ever going to face in my life. So why did I care if somebody hung up on me? Why did I care if somebody didn't buy, you know, what I was selling? Why did I care if my boss wanted me to make a hundred calls a day? Do, do you think I cared if I was being micromanaged compared to what I already dealt with? That means nothing. Right. And I, I you know, I somehow was liberated from whatever was holding me back before. And I, I got really good, really fast. And the rest is history. It's a lot That's to unpack awesome. there. But, no, no, I, I can't thank you enough for sharing that. Um, I actually was getting emotional during parts of it. I, I have, we'll go into another one. I give some, some parts of my own journey that are, are uh, highly, a little yeah. bit similar. But some of the things that are, I think you talked about there is one of the things you have to have. I found, I found most, however they get there, found really a lot of the great sales leaders and salespeople I met are the ones that are, they have that freedom, right? They have that freedom from, from fear that they, okay, I'm just going to go. I'm going to go. I'm going to be in the moment. I don't need to be right. It's a deal. It's a deal, whatever. I'm going to go. I'm going to show up and I'm free to work. I'm free to do the job. I'm free to ask the tough questions. And it sounds like a lot of that was built during that time. It's just. Yeah, yeah but it, it, it was 100%. You know, what is extremely liberating when you can get the perspective of what's the worst thing that can happen? I don't hit my quota. <laughs> Who cares? Yeah. What, do I lose my job? Oh, well, I'm sure I can find another job doing something. Right. And you know, that, that perspective is a little bit easier to have when you're, you know, I was 27 years old when I first got started, like 27 years old, I didn't have kids yet. I get that that perspective is easier than if you're, and now I'm 45. I have two kids. I've got a mortgage. Like it gets, you know, theoretically scarier. But if you can maintain the perspective of I've already defeated the worst thing, the worst opponent or whatever, the hardest thing I've ever, ever is going to happen to me. I've already been through. So I don't really worry about all this other stuff that most people worry about. You know, before we started recording, serious situation for some people, but you and I were both chatting about the banking thing. And I was making a joke like, you know, <laughs> nothing I can do about that. I don't know anything about banking. The whole world will collapse and I'll figure out how to exist or it won't. And I won't have stressed about it for 72 hours. Right. That's the way that I think about things. You know, oh, I just never was worried about uh, or stressed by closing deals and all that. <clears throat> and so I operated with the level of like carefree, you know, don't give a fuck kind of mentality. I don't care if this guy buys from me. I'm going to talk to 200 other people today if I have to. Somebody's going to say yes at some point. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm self-taught. Like I didn't, I didn't study sales. There was no podcast to listen to. I, there probably was books. I didn't read any books on business and selling. I never went through Sandler training or spin selling or any of this stuff. I, I was just wasn't that guy. Mm -hmm. I just was sort of doing things that came naturally to me and utilizing the perspective that I had 
you know, as an athlete, I suppose, as a leader, I suppose, as somebody who's gone through years and years of struggle and trauma and addiction and all this kind of thing. I, you know, I, I got lucky in a lot of respects. And only after I got deeper into the field that I sort of start studying all these other things and going like, oh, that thing that I did, that's what they call this. <laughs> this guy wrote about that thing 50 years ago that, yeah. that you're doing, right? I mean, your story and a lot of things boiled down to, and I've, I've been so fortunate, just the people that I've been able to talk to just doing this podcast and connecting. And it's, it's, it's fairly remarkable. Just, I get to talk to the brotherhood of badasses, brotherhood and sisterhood of badasses, a lot of people that have been through a lot of stuff. And then the one of the things I've, I've really started to understand is leadership is absolutely, I've never seen a, a really strong salesperson or sales mentor or anybody in the game and does it for a long time that doesn't have a strong deg degree of ability to lead self and others, right? And second is that ability, it, you know, whatever you call it, whatever you name it, but that ability to, uh, I just saw a post on LinkedIn today. It was about uh, the big real estate mogul grant something, but it's a, essentially about his ability to be confident in and how he leads and what he says, regardless of the outcome, right? Because you only have one opinion. You, you're never going to say the perfect words. And if you, you think you're going to say the perfect words based on based on anything, you're always going to fail, right? So it's that ability to lead self, the ability to not be afraid of that rejection and just the ability to, the habits just to continue to work. And that's like a constant theme across this. An absolute constant theme and above everything else, everything else just becomes a window dressing of how you empower those things, right? How do I train my salespeople as leaders with a great process that enables them to have the right habits, et cetera. But once I've found that really do it well, just intuitively, intuitively get it. I'm not sure there was a question there. That was kind of just me rant, <laughs> ranting, Scott. I get it. In, in, in one of the things that I utilized or, or got you know good at was tapping into the stories of the people that I worked with and ended up hiring. And a lot of times leaders are unwilling or unable to be vulnerable themselves. And they're just mm -hmm. looking for their team to, you know, be vulnerable. And I didn't have that because I've been very open about the things that I've been through and I hired for grit rather than acumen meaning when i was hiring i didn't care if you had 20 years of experience paul i wanted to know who you were today where you were trying to go and if you were open to help you know along the way so when when i'd have conversations with people especially later in my career where some of my story was known people would come in and they'd know my, some of my story and they would offer up like their own stories to like, I resonate with you because I've been through this. I've dealt with that. You know, I've been in this bad place in my life. I don't ever want to go back there, man. I'm looking to change my life and here's why and where I want to go. Can you help me get there? And I'm like, yeah, I'll take that person a hundred times out of a hundred over the person who's like, I've been in SaaS sales for 20 years and I've hit quota 106% 15 years straight. I don't give a shit. I don't care. Yeah. So it, it, it helps me, I believe, by, by being open and sharing the things that I've been through, tap into what's going on with Paul, what's going on with this person over here. And, and I could have conversations with them about their life, right? And better people sell better. So part of my role, I think, was to help people just get better at life. Certain decision-making, certain pieces of education, uh, certain just ways, mindset and psychology of, of being, whether that's, you know, happiness or, or making decisions faster. And, you know, I, I, I think that that's part of why I did well in sales leadership roles, because people felt like I actually gave a shit about them. And I wasn't just interested in them hitting their number just for the hell of hitting their number, right? I took the time to get to know what was going on and what had got them here and what was going on, holding them back for where they want to go. And like, let's, let's work through all that shit, you know? It's a lot more work than 
the kind of VP of spreadsheets type person who's like, okay, Paul, it's time for our one-on-one. Let's look at your uh, pipeline and go through a pipeline review together. Let's let's look at, let's do your OKRs. I didn't do any of that shit, man. None of it. It flew in the face of what everybody told me that I should be doing. I didn't care. I didn't do any of it. You know, and my bosses for the most part for 15, 16 years, they left me alone because what I was doing was working. You know, if we started to dip or I started to struggle at all, then you best believe I'd get an earful like, oh, you know, you need to be doing this, that and the other. But when things were working well, people people left me alone for the most part to, to run my teams the way that I felt like running them, you know. Uh, you, you're diving into like coaching and good coaching and the the impact of just being a real real person uh, as a coach and a real person as a, a leader, which is, I always say this, if I can't admit that I'm wrong or if I can't give you my story, if I can't share, then there's no reason why you'd ever trust me. Yeah. Uh, I've been wrong a whole lot, like, uh, like <laughs> a whole lot. And people's lives have been impacted by the fact that I've been been wrong you know as a sales leader and that's that doesn't feel good but i finally one of the most freeing things for me uh in my career was when i I actually had that ability to say i don't need to be perfect i just need to walk with you and i don't i'm not gonna walk with you perfectly either right i'm as messed up as you are and probably more so (laughs) uh but i can i can live life with you and i'm still not sure i'm doing it right but i know that i'm i know i'm trying you know but there, there's, like you say, going back to that freedom statement, it's like when you're free to be free to be you and uh, you're able to do it, you connect with people. And it sounds like that that's what you've done. You just made an absolute mission to yeah. connect. Well, you know, I, I think a lot of people ended up in sales because they didn't know what else to do or where, they had nowhere else to go. The very first line of the first book that I ever wrote so I wrote this book called Addicted to the Process, which talks about my journey into sales and, and my framework for, for selling. And the very first line of that book says, sales is the garbage can of jobs. That's the very first line. It collects all of the quote unquote trash that every other profession like threw away. It's like, you know, this is just my own perspective and how I look at it. It's like so many salespeople have screwed up histories or past whatever you know all these art history majors you're not working in art history you got all these liberal arts degree people that didn't know what they wanted to be they weren't focused or interested in being a doctor or a lawyer or whatever right but you have like the gift of gab you're charismatic you're motivated it's like i don't know where to go i end up in sales right so there's there's a a bond i think amongst salespeople who have all been at some point in time, somewhat of a degenerate <laughs> in their life. <laughs> you know? uh, and I think you, you just can own that a little bit and have a laugh at it uh. versus, you know, salespeople trying to relate to somebody who just finished their MBA at Stanford and they're 23 years old and mommy and daddy, you know, left them a $50 million trust fund. It's like, get the fuck out of here, dude. I don't know how to deal with that kind of thing, but I do know how to relate to this dude who's been through hell and back and has somehow come out the other side. Like I can relate to that person and I want to learn from that person. You keep your Stanford MBA and all that over there let me talk to this other person right so i I just kind of leaned into that you know i don't look like a vp of sales i look like a homeless person most of the time you know i don't talk like them i tell i say things out loud that a lot of people you know don't want being said out loud about the way things work you know equity for example and all this kind of stuff and and you know this is one way at least to gain trust of the people that you're working with, right? Is to be real and raw and open and honest with them. Yeah, I got a I got a quick story. I know we're we're on the the wrap up side of this timeline, but uh, it's funny you said something. The best salesperson I've ever met in my life. He actually happens to be one of my best friends, and I just absolute brother. But he also got me my first job in sales. And I I did the same thing as you. I came out of school. And I was like I I didn't want to. 
I, I didn't want to uh, go into the real world. So I got yeah. a master's degree and I was teaching and that was great. I was at University of Arizona and then he finally called me up. He's like, Hey, you want to stop being a hippie and get a job in sales? I was like, no, <laughs> no, I don't. But it was time. It was time to, to move on. So I moved to Columbus that, and I, I walked in my buddy he was, he was prepping a PowerPoint or something. And I came in with my, my uh, master's and I was like, you know what? I think, you know, from a communication perspective, this is this and this and this and this and this, uh, you know, you should change it. And he goes, you know what? From a real world perspective, you're full of shit. <laughs> like, it's like, okay, okay, I'm done. You know, I, uh, let me learn. Let me shut up and learn. <laughs> and it was one of my very first times when I was like, uh, you know, this is a different world. So I just got to sit here and learn the whole time. Like I just, else I'm going to get, I'm going to get it handed to me. And I did. I like every other salesperson. I got handed to me for a long time, but but uh, this, but it was one of those just. And he, you know, he went on to be a VP of sales with a quota, you know, that had a B after it instead of you know. Uh, and he's he's still the best salesperson I've ever met. And because he went through, he listened, he connected, and it was, he's just good. Man, I shouldn't be ending on my story. I should be ending on something you. Hey, when when. Uh, Give me the last the last word here for our conversation. Let's just give a helpful. There's some helpful uh, things that you can give. You got a salesperson listening to this. Let's say, actually, a sales leader. Let's say a sales leader that's uh, new in their sales leadership career. What is one of the biggest things from your perspective that they could be doing to to help their people and to grow? I mean, I think open yourself up, share your journey, and and the good and the bad and the ugly of how you got to, to where you are and, and where you're trying to go. And then really spend the time to get to know the people on your team that uh, you're working with and, and put in the time and the effort to understand well, what's going on with Paul. What makes Scott tick? How do I help them, you know, actually be motivated to, you know, sell better and improve versus just checking in, checking out, you know, and collecting a paycheck. So open yourself up and then dive into the people around you. It's, it's shockingly rare how few sales leaders do that. So simply by doing that, you've suddenly put yourself catapulted into the top 1% of all sales leaders, truly. Um, so that would, that, that would be my soundbite to leave them all with. Nice. Well, I thank you. I thank you a ton for sharing your experience and walking us through that. And, uh, I think it's going to make an impact on a lot of people. We'll get it out there. And how do people find you, Scott, if they want to connect? The easiest way to find me is on LinkedIn. I'm super active there. I, I respond to every you know, DM message that people send me. And uh, there's a lot of other stuff that I'm involved with. My, my consulting business, you can check it out at scottleesconsulting.com. I run a sales conference every single year, a couple times a year in Costa Rica called surfandsales.com. Any of those ways are a good chance to check out what I'm up to. Is that invite only, surf and sales? It is not invite only, actually. It is it's not. A, it's a limited okay. number of people every single session, 17 so, people per session. But you just got to be one of the first 17 people in. I was going to say, so we could, we could formulate how we start a surfboard company down there? Yes. Actually, one of the things that we do when, when we're at the event is we do an entrepreneurial, uh, I don't know how to describe it, game or, or, or whatnot, where everybody has to figure out what kind of company that they, they want to build. And then we pitch each other, recruit each other, build it all up. So yes, this is That's awesome. those types of ideas get gener generated. That is awesome. Well, hey, thanks again so much for coming along. I uh, Anytime, maybe if I can make the, I would love to. Gosh, that sounds that sounds like a great place to hold a sales conference and a great great yeah, thing. No, so that's, that's why I did it because I was tired yeah. of going to Omaha at staying yeah. at <laughs> for a sales conference. The convention center. Yeah. Omaha. No offense, Omaha. Omaha. Love you. <laughs> All right, man. Well, this has been awesome. I can't wait to do it again. Hopefully, sometime soon. But. Uh, Absolutely. With that, we'll be signing off for the Art and Science Complex Sales. And everybody just have uh, an amazing day and shine bright. We'll talk soon. Thank you so much for listening to the Art and Science of Complex Sales. 
This podcast is sponsored by Membrane and our partners from around the globe. Here at Membrane, we believe that B2B sales is at a crossroads. Due to decades of quantity-based prospecting, information overload, and really a shift towards efficiency over service and pitching over leadership in sales, customers are saying enough is enough. They're tuning out average performers and choosing to take most of the buying journey on their own. This results in up and down sales results, forecasts that are all over the place, and salespeople that are half committed due to the fact that they're having poor results and they have an inability to truly connect with customers. We believe the road successful companies are taking to combat this is threefold. Number one, training to create leaders and executives across all areas of the team with strong habits and sales methodologies that bring value. Number two, technology. Technology that focuses and helps a salesperson succeed and reinforces great habits rather than wasting their time on filling out fields for reporting or wasting their time on spamming customers that have no interest in ever buying. Third, talent. And I'm talking about talent that's empowered and emboldened to make a difference for their customers and their companies. So where are you on that journey? Membrane and our network of partners across the globe are here to help and to elevate the sales profession. We streamline critical technology by combining CRM, training and enablement, and more into one seamless platform. We drive best-in-class methodologies through our partners. They provide the top thought leadership methodologies and resources from across the globe. And our collective efforts are dedicated to recruiting, training, coaching, and empowering, and measuring the habits of the top teams in the world to ensure success. Join us at Membrane.com to learn more. And thank you so much for listening.